All right, good morning. morning. Want to welcome you to church today as Chris did, and we're so glad that you're here and that you could join us uh, today for worship. And uh, it, we, Andrea and I are happy to be back. We spent two weeks out of camp in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. If you've ever been up there, there's nothing but sand up there and pine trees. And uh, so uh, we were dirty uh, and dirty and dirty and dirty and dirty. Uh, so we were happy to get in our own bed where there's no sand in it. And uh, happy to get, the uh, kids were happy to be home yesterday, although they did play outside all day because they were used to being outside. So I know many of you were praying and praying for our kids and uh, praying uh, for the camp and those who spoke. Uh, ben was there two weeks ago helping lead worship. And, uh, and so it was a great time, and, but we are excited to be back. And uh, we're going to be starting a new series with you today uh, that is going to take us through the rest of the summer uh, into, uh, up into the school year, which we don't want to talk about that in our household too much. Uh, but we're going to be looking at some of uh, the Psalms. And for many of us, the Psalms are an important part of our lives. Uh, they've been an important part of our faith and developing our faith, and that's been true for thousands of years, uh, because the Psalms form the prayer book, the song book, the hymnal uh, for the Jewish faith and Jewish tradition, uh, but also for our Christian tradition. And so many of the Psalms are songs of praise, they are songs of ascent, uh, of going up to worship, uh, but then there are also songs of lament. And I think when we think about the Bible and we think about how we should act and how we should relate to life, uh, the Psalms are an important part for, for me because they show us how, how we can lament what is going on not only in our lives but in the world. That we can take our cares, we can take our worries, we can take our joys and our concerns, we can take our frustrations to God who is big enough uh, to take them all on, big enough to hear uh, what it is that we are concerned about. And so it is a, they are a teaching tool for us about how to pray, how to live how to be in relationship with one another. And so uh, throughout the next uh, month and a half, we're going to be looking at a different psalm each week. We won't get through the whole book because there's 150 of them. Uh, we'll get through about seven, and you'll have 143 left to look on at your own. Uh, but we're going to look at Psalm 24 today. So if you have your Bible and want to turn to Psalm 24, I'm going to read it for us. And then there, there are three distinct stanzas in Psalm 24. And I want to go through the stanzas and kind of get an image because this these are writings that are several thousands years old and, and understand what they mean uh, in their context and then be able to bring them forward to us today and say, why is this psalm important for us today? So Psalm 24, uh, notice we've missed Psalm 23 by one. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we may get there. We're trying not to hit the obvious ones, but uh, we'll see. So Psalm 24, it is a psalm of David. Uh, our tradition states that King David uh, wrote this psalm. It says this, the earth is the Lord and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it upon the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy presence? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. God, we pray uh, that as we worship, and we hear uh, the Psalms today, God, we pray and ask that you would open up our hearts to receive the message that is uh, in, in this Psalm, the encouragement that is in there for us. And we pray that you would help us to put it into practice in our lives. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us today that we might hear from you clearly. And God, we pray any distraction that we may have in our own hearts, any worry, anxiety, or care, God, we lift them to you and ask that you would take them. And so Holy Spirit, speak in me and through me and in spite of me today, that we might hear from you. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so as we begin today, we are looking at, at Psalm 24. It, 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 it kind, of feel, uh, kind of makes and forms a triptych of sorts uh, with Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. Uh, some commentators will talk about the different journeys that are taken in each of those psalms. But in Psalm 24, the image that you should have as you read this psalm is of pilgrims, is of worshipers going into the city of Jerusalem and ultimately up to the, the, the tabernacle or the temple and, and going to worship. 
and it is a high holy time, and they are coming before God to worship uh, the Lord together. It is also, uh, it's, it's a call and response, and if you look in there, there's questions and answers in there. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And, and those who have clean hands and, and a pure heart. And so it was part of a liturgy that these pilgrims would have spoken and recited back and forth to one another, which is all fine and good. But the real question remains is, what does it mean for us today? Because we still can read the Psalms, and we see that, that there is this great chasm of, of thousands of years for us to see. And so it begins, again, with saying, the earth is the Lord and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him, for he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. And as we, we listen to the psalm, it should take us back to creation. It should take us back to the creation account of, in Genesis of, of God creating the world. And it says in, in verse 2 uh, that God laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it upon the waters. And in Genesis chapter 1, uh, we hear how God hovered over the primordial waters uh, of creation. And in ancient Near East culture, waters was also all, often a symbol of chaos, of disorder, and the early cre the creation account speaks of how God ordered the world, that in creating, he ordered it, gave everything a purpose and a place. And so as we think of this, as we see that God laid the earth's foundations on the sea, built it upon the ocean depths, we should not only see the creation of land on water, which is one of the days... Uh, of the creation story, uh, but we should also see that how God is giving order and purpose to all of creation, which includes you and I. So for those of you who feel like your world is a little disordered right now, uh, we kind of have felt that way over the last couple months, uh, disordered, uh, that God is a God of order. And as we look, and that's why in worship, we have order in worship. And Paul talks about that in, in, in 1 Corinthians as well. And so this is important for us because uh, the idea is, is that God is the creator over everything. And not just the physical world like trees and rocks and plants and animals, but that God is king over you and me. And so if you go on and, and you go back and you look in your Bible uh, through this text where you can see everything together, you'll see that, that the use of the word king and that God is king is, is repeated. I think it's five times in the ten verses. Who is the king of glory, the Lord strong and mighty? Who is the king of glory? All, all this idea about, the, about God being king. And, and even in verse 1, we're saying that, that, the, that God is Lord over everything, that he is king over everything. And so we're going to come back to that idea. Keep that in your mind. If you have your own Bibles, go and underline each time the word king or king of glory shows up in there. And so God is the king of the world. And, and the psalm kind of gives this indication, not because God has conquered anything, but the, the testimony of the scriptures is that God is king of the world because God has acted in love and grace in creating us, uh, in creating the world. That creation was an act of love. It was an act of grace. It was an act of mercy. And, and so that, that God became king not by conquering you and I, but because of acting with love and grace towards us, that we have the ability to, to become loyal uh, to, and, and to subjugate ourselves to God's authority in God's rule. And so the very existence of creation is a result of grace uh, of our creator God. And so the challenge of the psalm, and this psalm in Psalm 24, is this. How will we choose to live in God's kingship and grace? How will we choose to live with the knowledge that God is our king, that God is uh, our sovereign? Uh, and of course, you know, we just celebrated Fourth of July a few weeks ago, and uh, we, we proudly celebrate that we don't have a king. Uh, and so but we have in our, in our spiritual life, when it comes to our faith in Christ, this term king is used often, and we can see it in different ways. But who, how will we choose to live with God's kingship? And so that's the first stanza. The second stanza goes on to talk about this idea about who can enter God's space. That if, if everything is God's kingdom, if all of creation is a result of God's love and grace, then who can enter God's space? And... and uh, the image of the psalm, again, is of pilgrims processing in Jerusalem. The temple was believed to be the intersection of heaven and earth. And so to go to the temple was to go to the very place where God resided, uh, where God's presence could be known. Certainly God was, was all places, but, but that the temple was that intersection of heaven and earth between the divine and the profane. 
and, and so that you could go and encounter the presence of God there. And, and at the high holy times, uh, at the Day of Atonement, a single priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and uh, they would go in with a rope around them so that in case they encountered the presence of God, and it was so great that they died, uh, that they could pull them out so there'd be nothing unclean inside the Holy. It was, it was a terrifying space. Only one person could do it a year. And so this question of who can enter God's space became important. I don't know if any of you would like that job uh, to go into the Holy of Holies knowing you might die. Uh, at least that was the belief. Uh, but that is what they did. And so the answer then in, in verse 3 and 4 is that the person that can enter the Holy of Holies is those who have clean hands and a pure heart. I think Ben sang a song about that just a few minutes ago. Uh, that, that those who have a clean hand and a pure heart. And this is not just that the priest had to wash their hands uh, before then. This is not a ritualistic language. The Hebrew wording in here is more ethical and moral. That those who have clean hands and a pure heart are morally pure and ethically pure. That they have put their faith into practice and their practice aligns with their beliefs and their beliefs about God and who God is. Who can enter into the space of God. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord, which was the temple? Only those whose hearts are pure, and then he, the psalmist goes on to write, and who does not worship idols and never tells lies. Now, this is important for us because the idea uh, of idols in here, and the, the, the Hebrew literally means those who do not hunger for emptiness. And, and we translate it today into uh, those who do not worship idols. And, and so think about the many things in our lives uh, that, that we talk about and, and, and we can pursue that the psalmist writes, who can, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can go into God's presence, come into God's presence? Those who have a pure heart and clean hands, those who do not hunger after empty things. Some translations will even, even say non-gods. Those are the ones who can, uh, those, those are the ones who can worship God. We are not to put anything in front of our worship of God, our pursuit of God, our priority of God in our lives. And just as the first stanza allowed us to have echoes of the creation story, this stanza gives us echoes of the Ten Commandments. Because uh, one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not have any gods before me. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Those who have a pure heart and clean hands and who do not worship any other gods. And so submission to the king of all creation is, is shaped by the teaching of Scripture. That we are able to go deeper in our faith in God, deeper in our walk with God, deeper in our understanding of how we can submit our lives to the rule of God in our life, the more we study Scripture, the more we allow it to seep into our lives, the more we understand uh, uh, about what it means not to worship idols, that we, that we don't pursue things that are empty and in the end have no, have no bearing on our lives that we don't worship non-gods, but that we will worship the one true God who is the Lord over all of creation. And so the reward, the psalmist says, for this is God's blessing and a right relationship with God. The reward for this living this life ethically and morally that reflects the life and the character of God, uh, of not worshiping idols and putting the, uh, God first in our lives, the reward is God's blessing, God's presence in our life, and it is a right relationship <laughs> with God. And so the final stanza then talks about the king of glory coming into Jerusalem. And, and again, it is a procession. And so we should look at and think of and hear and hear uh, a parade, a procession coming in and everyone is excited. And the psalmist writes over and over again in the last couple verses, open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors and let the king of glory in. I like the, the NIV here, and it says this. It says, lift up your head, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors. The king of glory will come in. Who is the king of glory? Do you keep hearing this king of glory? And, and the repeated use of lift. Who is the king of glory? The Lord Almighty, for he is the king of glory of glory. And the stanza is like the city preparing uh, for a great parade. Think about February when Philadelphia was preparing for their Super Bowl parade. Um, I'll try to use that. I'll be a nice, nice person here since 
Pittsburgh hasn't had one in a year for the Penguins. But uh, So you think about the preparations that Philadelphia went through for the Eagles. They got the streets lined up. They blocked off everything else. Everyone knew where the procession was going to go. You could go up ahead of time. People were arriving in downtown Philadelphia at 3, 4 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, so that they could get their spot on the processional route uh, so that they could cheer on the Eagles as they came through uh, the city. And, and the image is similar to that in the idea of a God coming through or a king coming through and everyone lining the streets, and everyone preparing and, and says, uh, who is this king of glory? Lift up your heads, you ancient gates. Get ready, open the gates, open the doors for the king of glory will come in. Now, we need to understand the kind of gates that were used in Jerusalem. Uh, in my mind, uh, when I think about gates a lot of times and city gates and stuff, uh, I think of something from like, um, like, like medieval Europe and, and the idea of those, those gates uh, that, that kind of lower uh, and go up and down and have the little pointy things at the bottom. And if you get uh, caught underneath, that's also a Star Wars image in my mind, that kind of like the gates drop. Uh, you know, that that would be an image of gates. But in ancient Jerusalem, the gates were on hinges, much like our doors are, and they would pivot outward or inward, but mostly outward. And so this is the image of the doors. So the gates did not lift, and if the gates did not lift, why does the psalmist com- repeatedly say, lift up your head, O ancient gates? The psalms are also poetic. And so when we look at them, it is... Uh, not necessarily, the words are not literal in the sense of lifting up the ancient gates because the gates at Jerusalem didn't lift up. Uh, they opened uh, and they turned. And, and so one thing the psalmist is saying, and, and commentators say that in the Hebrew, the connotation is when, it, when the psalmist asks, says, lift up your heads, O ancient gates, the psalmist is speaking to us. That when we lift up our heads, uh, that when we lift up our heads, we are acknowledging the presence of God and acknowledging that God is God. And so to lift, to lift one head at God's entrance is the knowledge that God is the king over everything. So that when we lift up our hearts, God lifts us up. Or when we lift up our head, God lifts us up. When we acknowledge that God is God, we, we receive that blessing in the right relationship with him as, as the psalmist says in the middle stanza of the psalm. So what does, what does it mean for us? What's the importance of this? Uh, we have a uh, a, a city, an ancient city, an ancient temple, a hill, a procession, pilgrims, gates lifting or being opened, and we're turning our head. I want to challenge us, and, and I think we've talked about this before, certainly, but that we have the temptation and the opportunity to have many false gods or empty gods in our lives. And that the psalmist writes that those who can enter God's space are the ones who do not worship false gods or empty gods or even non-gods. The ones who enter God's space are the ones who who do not put other gods before the Lord God Almighty. And and I I don't think any of us, maybe you do, I don't know, have uh, bronze or golden or silver idols in your house that that you regularly will bow down to and worship. Uh, Some of you maybe with Super Bowl trophies for the Eagles. Chris, do you have one? I don't know. I know you're excited. Becca says no, because the Panther fan would throw it out. So uh, you know, none of us have those things in our house necessarily. But yet we, there are other things that we worship in our culture uh, that, that we give power to the ideas of money. Uh, we give power uh, to uh, political ideology and concepts. We give power to the idea of material possessions. And we give power to the idea of even the American dream, that those things can become uh, primary in our lives and in place of our relationship with God, where they dictate our actions and our life, our ethical and moral decisions, uh, our clean hands and a pure heart, rather than our relationship with God. And these ideas and concepts begin to influence our decisions. And if we, if we make our country our idol or the American dream, it will disparage those who think less of or who do not share our views and values. If material bless, uh, possessions are our idol then we will work long, idle, long hours ignoring our relationship with God, ignoring our relationship with our family in order to have the right car, the right house, or the right vacation. And we can worship these idols believing that we are just trying to provide for our family, but what we're really doing is we're worshiping the idol of having more rather than being content where God 
has us. And even then, we can make an idol out of our family and where we put our family ahead of our relationship with God. And there's a delicate balance there because our family is our first ministry and first, one of our first priorities after our relationship with God. So think about what happened last week. I'm sure you heard about it. Build-A-Bear offered a uh, pro promo uh, that you could go and get a bear made for your child's age. Did anyone happen to go up or try to go up? Anyone want to admit it? I have a friend back home who waited nine hours uh, to get with their kids, because uh, I think they had to be presents to prove their age or something like that. They waited nine hours for Build-A-Bear bear that you could pay like, what, $35 for, and they got it for like $9? I think I'd have paid the 35 bucks and just come back another time. Uh, but think about this. All across the country, wherever Build-A-Bear was, Christiana Mall had a line wrapping outside the mall. You know, other places, people had to shut them down. They cut the lines off. All of these things. Nine hours for a stuffed animal. Nine hours for a stuffed animal. Nine hours. Nine hours. Now, I could see a lot of other things and experiences that you wait in line and you do with your family and, and stuff to make memories. I'm not sure that Chloe or Abby or Malachi want to have the memory of waiting in line for nine hours for a stuffed animal. I don't know. That's just me. But, you know, we'll wait in line. And, and think about this when it comes to priorities. We'll wait in line for nine hours for a stuffed animal or an amusement park or, you know, Taylor Swift was last night in Philadelphia. I don't know if anyone went to see any Swifties here, uh, you know, but we had friends that went and saw Taylor Swift last night, and, and, and we do. You go to a concert, it's an all-day thing, right? You start getting ready, you, you get the right clothes on, you go out to eat, you go to the concert, you get there early, so you can take in everything, and, and it becomes an all-day affair. And we'll do those things but then when it comes to our relationship with God, we struggle to put emphasis on studying our Bible. We're taking time to pray. We're serving the poor as God calls us to. We're loving our neighbor. And I wonder how often we, we see these good things. They're not bad things. But we see them in such a way that they become idols for us. Or they become, they become something that we put our time and energy to in the place of in the place and in the end, these, these empty things, they, they leave us nothing. We can't take them with us when we die. Uh, maybe we can pass them on, but even less and less, uh, uh, you know, children don't want their parents' stuff after, uh, you know, when those happen. Some of you have had to clean out your parents' stuff, and uh, it becomes a very difficult thing uh, to do. And they can certainly bring some happiness for a moment, but there comes a time and a place in our lives where we don't need just another happy adventure, but we need to know the salvation and love of God. In verse 1, the psalmist says uh, that, that, that God is Lord over all the earth, and that the earth is, is God's, everything that is in it. And so as you go today, I want you to think about all the implications that that phrase can have for us. Socioeconomically, it has it has implications on how we how we relate with our finances and with our money geopolitically like it has emphasis and in, in implications on on how we how we live politically and actively in the world how we make our decisions and not just voting for people but but what we get involved with and where we put our time and our energy to uh, it has implications on environmentally and on seeing that the earth is god's not ours and, and we should think of, of, of uh, parables, like the uh, parable uh, of um, the, uh, the stewards, you know, where one was given ten talents, the parable of talents, ten talents, the other five and the other, other two or one. And, and we were given the task of doing something with it. And those that did something with it and made more were rewarded, and the other one who buried his talent in the ground and did nothing with it uh, was punished. You and I have been made stewards over God's world. The earth is the Lord and everything in it, including you and me. And the question remains is that how, how do we live in that? How do we submit to God's rule and God's kingdom? And then how do we acknowledge that God is God? How does our life, how does our actions, how does uh, the way we live and sh the decisions we make reflect the lordship of God, the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives? And so when we acknowledge and submit to God's sovereignty, the reign of God, we can experience God's blessing in our faith. 
And that's the promise in the middle of that middle stanza. That those who are able to come with clean hands and pure heart, not worshiping empty idols, will enjoy the blessings of God and a right relationship with God, our Savior. And through our Christian lens, we see that as Jesus, as God, our Savior. So today, as, as, as we prepare to close and we think about where we are and we think about the psalm, we start out with a psalm of creation, a psalm that reminds us of our place in this world, that everything is God's, and that in order to enter God's space, we submit to the reign of God in our lives. And when we do that, we can enjoy God's blessing in a right relationship with God. Let's pray together. God, thank you for, for your love and grace that led you to create an incredible and magnificent world. Your love and grace uh, that enabled someone like me to know who you are, to have my sins forgiven, uh, that we would encounter you in such a way uh, that we know you personally through Jesus Christ. We don't have to go to the temple once a year and have a priest make sacrifices on our behalf but because of the sacrifice of Jesus that we can approach your throne with confidence because of Jesus who intercedes for us and mediates on our behalf. God, I pray that our lives would reflect your love and grace. God, I pray that in our decision-making, in our priority-making in our lives, that we would seek to honor you because, because you are our king and our Lord. Our lives are not our own, uh, but we live, we, we live for you to bring you joy and pleasure. So God, help us to go this day to share your love and grace to those around us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.